सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली थर्टी टू ईयर्स नाउ फ्रॉम दिनेशन ऑफ राजीव गांधी नाउ डू वी डू वी कीप टॉकिंग अबाउट राजीव गांधी इवन नाउ थर्टी टू ईयर्स हैं how important was he what kind of a role did he play we see that very often the bjp attacks him his years buffers and things like that recently i saw something else come up that rajiv gandhi had mandal commission report had actually been delivered in his times but he put it away instead of implement, implemented it he spoke up against it in parliament now all those issues keep coming up was he significant enough for us to keep talking about him now we've talked about him in the past there was episode 158 that was that was several years ago i think 3 or 4 years ago i will share a link with you you can see that that had come out after after prime minister modi said that he represented corruption in india's history right after that we had looked at his record some aspects of it so he is not somebody we haven't talked about but he is also not somebody we should not keep talking about now there are people not just in bjp there are people in other parties who think that he has exaggerated importance in our history mayawati for example is one of them and mayawati it was who on the 25th anniversary of rajiv gandhi's assassination she sparked a thought in my mind which led to an article that i wrote then for india today on 25 years of rajiv gandhi the magazine was doing a special issue on what his contribution was and i was to look more in areas of my interest those those are areas of national security foreign policy stuff like that but you know once you start reflecting and thinking you realize two things one that many of these people who may have lost power whose parties may have lost power but anybody who's been in a position like that has left impact good bad pretty ugly all kinds of impact and many things then carry on so a lot of what we see happening right now is a continuum of what happened in the past and that's why it's important for us to keep looking at these personalities also assessing them and reassessing them in the light of the facts as they exist now rajiv gandhi for example if you ask me for a headline point right or a nut graph as we call it in journalism rajiv gandhi was a patriot who ruled at a very tough juncture his degree of difficulty in governing india then was unfairly masked by the size of his mandate he got a humongous mandate 415 out of out of 543 he squandered that mandate see i told you that i will not say only good things or only bad things i will try and be as factual as i probably can from my knowledge not as i probably can in terms of my choices but in terms of my knowledge so he also squandered that brilliant mandate just as spectacularly as he had achieved it youthful promise of change gave way to cynical politics that had defeat written all over it so what did mayawati say that sparked this thought 7 years back mayawati had raised an interesting question when she was under attack for a statue and memorial building for dalit icons forward caste or what she called as manuvadi caste could hardly object she said as they had already filled our streets and parks with their own leaders busts jahan dekho nehru aur indra she said wherever you look you find nehru and indra and that was still understandable she said but what justified such iconography around rajiv gandhi that you couldn't drive 2 miles in a city without passing two rajiv chowks delhi is actually a pretty good example of that connaught place was renamed rajiv chowk in delhi in the heart of new delhi then she went on to say rajiv gandhi was just an ordinary 5 year prime minister who made no mark Now how do we start assessing Rajiv Gandhi even 32 years after he was gone so i will take you back to a cover story the first cover story that india today did after he had taken over not 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 the fortnight of the election but after he had taken over and that cover story had a brilliant classic rograi picture on the cover with rajiv gandhi adjusting his cap and the cover headline was will the cap fit that question was and has been debated by contemporary and pre googleists like me 
in his life and death and continues to be debated in his death even now, 32 years hence. This is what Mayavati was asking in her own cutting way. For our generation of reporters, Rajiv was the first Prime Minister to be 100% contemporary. All the others had come from freedom movement, etc. Or from before our times. He joined politics when we were already on the political beat. He lost his mother, won a mandate so big it will probably never be matched. As I told you earlier, 415 in a house of 543. He promised a new India for the 21st century. Ushered in the computer age for sure, vowed the world with his youthful sincerity, his immortal line, I am young, I too have a dream. And that line he spoke at the joint session of the US Congress and Senate on Capitol Hill. He was then truly lionized there. There were festivals of India being held all over the world, democratic world, especially, especially in the US. He truly also, he truly launched India's nuclear weaponization. That story I have told you in an earlier episode of Karta Clutter on the anniversary of Pokhran 2. Just a couple of weeks back, I will share a link of that with, with you as well. Then as spectacularly as he had achieved the mandate, he squandered it too. The youthful promise of change giving way to cynical old politics that had defeat written all over it. At the same time, he also initiated a robustly confident military modernization that was promising to make India a strategic powerhouse. But ultimately, because of his missteps, the country, India, which had promised to be a global military powerhouse, in fact, Time magazine then had a cover story, headline Super India. His missteps ultimately reduced India to an arrogant interventionist neighborhood bully in retreat. Was Mayabati therefore right to raise the questions that she did? That is, who was Rajiv Gandhi? What contributions did he make that he should be making, naming landmarks after him? You could answer the question by reminding her that her own rise, that of her politics, her mentor Kashiram and his Bahujan Samaj parties owed to Rajiv. If he hadn't demolished his own party's underclass vote bank, it was in his time that Congress party destroyed its underclass vote bank. It was in, if, if, if he had not demolished his own party's underclass vote bank, neither she nor the new heartland Mandalites, fortified by Muslims, would have risen. In fact, Mandal Commission report was presented in Rajiv Gandhi's times and he, instead of moving forward with it, preferred to bury it or put it in cold storage. It is just that she asked a question that assails the mind of anybody who lived through Rajiv's times, particularly as a political reporter. Truth to tell, in Rajiv Gandhi years, I was still too junior to cover the Prime Minister or, or his office. I cannot claim to have known Rajiv Gandhi well personally or one-on-one -on -one professionally. I met him with some groups of journalists, mostly after he lost power. A reporter's life is all about timing and coincidences. The irony in my case is that that through Rajiv's political life, I was too young to cover him directly, but by 1991, I was old enough to cover his assassination in great detail, including from Sri Lanka, and pursue that story for a long time afterwards. Those we have spoken about in my series, my first person, second draft series on Sri Lanka. At the same time, most of my reportorial time in that decade was invested either covering his significant actions, policies, and their consequences. These include his peacemaking with rebels. Now, some of his peacemaking worked, some of his peacemaking did not work. For example, in Punjab, as he came into power, he had come into power in the wake of his mother's assassination, Operation Blue Star, his mother's assassination, the, the massacres of the Sikhs in Delhi and elsewhere. We had a very broken society at that point, especially in North India. In that situation, among the first moves he made were, was to reach out to Sikh moderates to try and make peace with them. Now, he signed a settlement accord with Sant Tharchan Singh Logawal, who was then a kind of the presiding saint and head of the Shiromani Akali Dal, but that was the moderate side. He and others around him had been completely marginalized in the Bhindra Wale era. So he signed an agreement with him, but in fact, it was thanks to the go-between there, the gentleman in Delhi called Mr. Amar Amarjeet Singh Sarna, who is a well-known Delhi businessman, who was carrying the messages between Sant Sant Longoval and Rajiv Gandhi. Longoval, at that point, was quote-unquote locked up 
in a prison. So this was a circuit house kind of place in Udaipur, which had been declared a central jail and Longoval was detained there. And that is where Mr. Sarna used to take messages from the government and bring messages back. And it was in that period at one point, I have to thank Mr. Sarna for it. He also smuggled me into that circuit house in Udaipur and at least got me a bunch of questions. I wrote those questions in longhand on my little notepad and he got answers from Mr. Longoval to those questions in writing, in his handwriting, in Punjabi, in Gurmukhi. That agreement, we all celebrated it big time. We thought Punjab was going to have peace, but that didn't work because shortly afterwards, in fact, just a few months, just a couple of months after that, Sant Longoval was assassinated in Punjab. Then of the other agreements that he signed, he was in a hurry to settle India's long-standing problems. He, for example, settled the Assam agitation. He signed an agreement with Assam agitation leaders, then Praful Mahanta and Brigu Fukan. Brigu Fukan is no more now. So their agitational group, All Assam Gansangram Parishad, AGSP, and All Assam Students Union, they then coalesced into a political party. There was an election. That election, the Congress party lost. And this party, led by the agitators, came into power. I covered that election and I will tell you one particularly comical, ironical, you can choose your description. I would also say one very, very touching moment from those elections. That is when the helicopter carrying Amitabh Bachchan. Now, Amitabh Bachchan then was a Congress Party MP. He was campaigning for Rajiv Gandhi at the Congress Party. That helicopter landed in the middle of an opposition rally. In a rally of the, in a rally of the Assam Gun Parishad. So the accords with the Assam agitators and the Mizo leader, Lal Denga, those worked. Those worked, one with Longobal failed. Now failure to protect Longobal's life under Rajiv's hand-picked young governor then Arjun Singh in Punjab was his first setback. But as terror returned to Punjab, his fight back was firm and unyielding. His operation Black Thunder in 1988 was a clinical success as much as Indira Gandhi's Blue Star was a messy, bloody conquest that, that led to a hundred thousand, maybe a million bad consequences. Operation Black Thunder was the opposite. In fact, as we speak now, this is also the week of the anniversary of Operation Black Thunder. And if I can get my thoughts together in time, I might give you one more episode of First Person Second Draft. Now, however big a success Operation Black Thunder might have been, Rajiv never really succeeded in putting out the fire in Punjab. The Punjab terror complicated the second half of his prime ministership further. Khalistanis had become more powerful overseas. Many key terrorists had escaped there and Air India 747 was blown up in mid-air. In June 1985, Rajiv had only been in power for six months. And I believe Rajiv spent many days and nights worrying obsessively about a threat to himself, but more to his family from a top terrorist, Gurbachan Singh Mano Chahil. To the extent that when he was caught, when Mano Chahal was caught, he insisted on being personally briefed on his interrogation on a daily basis. You want to know more about it? Someday you have to have Mr. Ajit Doval tell you that story. Certainly, I'm not suggesting that he's told it to me, but I know that he knows. The peacemaking in Assam and Mizoram, however, endured. These were much more large-hearted than Punjab, as he knew his party would cede political power in these states to former rebels. This is why peace in Mizoram and Assam is among Rajiv's most valuable and lasting, lasting contributions, even 32 years after his assassination. My enduring journalistic memory of the finest side of Rajiv, the statesman, is his smilingly waving at crowds in the Assam elections of December 1985. After the accord, greeting him with Rajiv Gandhi Zindabad, Congress Party Murdabad. The early part of the earliest part of Rajiv prime ministership, say the first year or so, he could do nothing wrong. He could do nothing wrong. The rest was downhill. The downhill movement started in his second year and then picked up momentum as he went along. So as a result, by the time 1989 came and he came up for re-election, his government had lost far too much power, far too much prestige, too much damage was done. And that's the reason he could not win his second innings. 
and that's also the reason Congress party has never got a majority again. In fact, as I had mentioned earlier in answer to Mayavati's question, that many of his actions destroyed his own party's vote banks. I recall from that period a conversation with Arun Shori. As is usual for him, he had started raising questions about Rajiv. Watching him speak on Doordarshan once, Arun's mother, Arun Shori's mother, chided him for not even sparing such a nice man. I have that story from Arun Shori. Are you looking for a prime minister or a son-in-law? Arun says. He asked his mother. It is, however, precisely because of the love and expectation that Rajiv began to get that his missteps led to such rapid disenchantment. For Rajiv, while the first year was brilliant, years two and three represented stutter and stall. The last two, 87 to 89, were pure disaster. I can spell it in all capitals. In his first year, even Rajiv Gandhi's gaffes made us smile lovingly, except something like when a big tree falls, he earth shakes. That, that haunts his memory and his legacy even now. He could never pronounce Sant Logoval's name right, though it was quite simple with two consonants linked by three vowels, but he called him Longewalaji instead. By his fourth and fifth year, he could say nothing that didn't become a joke. So in his first year, anything he said, even if it was a stutter, even if he had misspoken about something, people will forgivingly smile and laugh. By his fourth and fifth year, anything he, he said became a joke. For example, Hum jeetenge and losenge, again an immortal line. That being, that became the most stunning of these, although it was a mere slip during a downhill election campaign. There were some before that also. His description of the opposition MPs in parliament as limpets. And the worst of all, the worst of all, at least in my book, but by now forgotten because these were pre-internet days, his dismissing S. Jaipal Reddy by attacking him, by attacking him in parliament over Bofors with, and I quote, with he doesn't have a leg to stand on. So we know that Jaipal Reddy, widely respected and admired as a parliamentarian, was a childhood case of polio. Rajiv's blunders, some of youthful, inexperienced exuberance, and frankly, many sins of commission, Shah Banuto, Shilanayas, and many others in between. These led to a situation where he was he was found, found sort of whining. Nani Yadil Adenge at Boat Club when he was under political siege. So, in the process, from the promise of regional power status to India, India, India was reduced to a flailing neighborhood bully in ignominious retreat in Sri Lanka. Rajiv Gandhi himself had been reduced from Mr. Clean to Bofors Chore, as he was called, and from the great political reformer to just another dynast in deep panic, who brought in as his deputy in the party, Loyalist Kamlapati Tripathi, a personification of exactly what he had said was wrong with the Congress party. So formidable was Rajiv's mandate that how he lost it has become the dominant story subsequently. But his score sheet is not at all splattered, splattered in red ink. His modernizing mind, love of the computer, evangelizing Panchayati Raj, and devolution of power are significant contributions. In his own hesitant way, he had started to reform India's economy, at least until VP Singh was still his friend and finance minister. In 1987, India faced the worst drought of the century, and as TN and noted later in an article in India Today magazine, it became the first year in India's history that India's economy grew in spite of the drought, in spite of a big drought. This is because the Rajiv era saw rise in the share of services and industry in our GDP. Significant changes in foreign policy saw him warm up to Ronald Reagan and Caspar Weinberger came calling in 1986, the first US Secretary of Defense to do so in decades. Let me, however, talk in greater detail about his contribution in one key area that I covered closely. Raji brought a refreshingly young and energetic view of India's military and strategic power and was more willing to employ it than this perfect gentleman, nice guy, demeanor would have suggested. He launched a massive wave of military acquisitions. Such was the pace that by the end of 1985, I had already written a cover story on India Today's defense modernization for India Today magazine. And one of the newly acquired Mirage 2000s was the lead visual. It was one of those Mirage 2000s that were used in the Balakot strike. My personal story of that assignment, however, is a near tragedy as a Mirage 
making low and very slow passes at Gwalior for our photographer Bhavan Singh to take pictures, went into a momentary stall so low that it was lost momentarily. It was lost in a cloud of dust and we presumed the worst. We presumed the plane had been lost. It had hit the ground and crashed. Until just a microsecond later, the Mirage screamed out of the cloud, cloud of dust, afterburners, spewing flames almost at our eye level. The pilot's skill and presence of mind had saved the day as he engaged the afterburners for an added surge of power and broke his stall. Wing Commander Ajit Bhavnani, Wing Commander then, a Marshal later, Wing Commander Ajit Bhavnani, who was raising India's first Mirage Squadron, the 7th Battle Axis, he was relieved, but think about us. We were not trained to be fighter pilots and we did not understand the risks. So we were in shell shock. Ajit Bhavnani, as I mentioned to you, rose to be an air marshal commanding India's strategic forces and we became friends for life. Rajiv shared with his old friend and most trusted aide then, they fell out later, Arun Singh, a love for gadgets and instruments of war with an almost teenager-like enthusiasm. His five years marked the most relentless military modernization in our history. And I don't say that lightly. Regrettably, it also destroyed him as scandals broke out soon enough. The Rajiv Arun Singh partnership was complemented by the rise of two unusual Indian soldiers, General Krishna Swami Sundarji and Admiral R.H. Tahiliani. Even as Western Army commander, Operation Blue Star took place under his watch, by the way, Sundarji had acquired fame for his radical ideas on junking, old concepts of static warfare, endless slugfests with tanks and artillery, where little ground was given or taken. His idea was now a much faster war fighting profile where mobile juggernauts will roll on over the ditch come buns, as those are called, that are, those are obstacles for tanks built around, built around ditches or canals in the subcontinent and move beyond that, move beyond that relentlessly without stopping. This appeal to Rajiv and Arjun Singh had a massive re-equipping with tanks, infantry fighting vehicles, and of course, Beaufort's artillery was initiated. Mechanized infantry units were formed as assault replaced defense as the buzzword. So that these more radical ideas that are rapids and ramids, rapids and ramids stand for reinforced army planes, and reinforced army mountain divisions. These were accepted, these ideas. Even in the mid 80s, Sundarji and Arun Singh conjured up the dream of an airborne assault division and one, the 54th at Hyderabad, was earmarked for the role even if the helicopters needed for it were still not in place. Mirages were followed by more of the new MiG series, 23, 27, 29 and the trisonic MiG-25. Admiral Tahiliani was allowed to reconfigure India's naval doctrine from coastal defense and limited sea denial in Arabian Sea only to a blue water profile. Some of this went too far also as sometimes military euphoria does. Rajiv, for example, went on a family holiday to Lakshadweep with quite a bit of the Indian Navy, especially the flagship then aircraft carrier Virat in attendance. And that got him quite a bit of bad press, as you would expect. For three and a half decades now, Rajiv has been attacked on Bofors. But it is still... India's frontline artillery gun and a game changer. We know that a few more have come lately, especially the American howitzer. So these have made a difference, but still the main artillery force, still the heart of the artillery force of Indian Army is the Bofors gun, the upgraded, upgunned Bofors gun. Such was Rajiv's impact that even today in a conflict, Indian armed forces will field a lot of the equipment he ordered more than three decades ago. Of course, military power is heady and amateurs can get carried away. Some of that happened with Rajiv as well. How do we say so? In fact, I should correct myself and say, this is what happened with the Rajiv Arun Singh duo under the influence of Sundarji's dash. This led to the reckless exercise brass tacks. <clears throat> now, Sundarji wanted to check out his new mobile warfare concepts in an exercise, exercise brass tacks that looked as real as possible, but it spooked the Pakistanis and brought India and Pakistan very close to a war. And then he responded, he wasn't done with it. And Rajiv and Arun Singh were not done with it because it was heady. So they started another exercise, another, I would say, provocative exercise facing China called checkerboard, right? Chinese checkers, remember? Checkerboard. And when the Pakistanis responded by doing their own counter exercises and deployments, then Sundarji launched 
exercise strident in the northern Kashmir area. Suddenly, it looked as if nobody knew what was happening and India seemed poised for a true front war with Pakistan and China. Now, as alarms spread in global capitals, Rajiv finally did calm things down, appointing VP Singh as defense minister, thereby restraining Arun Singh. But he was still not cured of the headiness of his new military muscle. He loved force projection in the neighborhood. He sent paratroopers in his new IL-76s and AN-32s to help defeat a coup attempt in the Maldives in 1988 and embarked on a full-scale peacemaking intervention in Sri Lanka by sending in the Indian peacekeeping force. That we, that we have talked about in detail in our Sri Lanka series. Now, I have always maintained that the Sri Lanka intervention by itself was not such a bad idea. It went wrong, that we know, that story we know. It's also because sadly for him, such military adventures need to have wide popular support, which it did not. In fact, by the end of 1987, when IPKF happened, he had lost much political capital. Not only did he get a lot of infamy because of it, a lot of criticism, ultimately he also lost his life to it because it is the it is the Tamil rebels, the LTTE, which took revenge by assassinating him 32 years back. So how do you assess this? I'd rather go by what my friend and RSS ideologue S. Kurumurthy once told me, that in choosing the method and place of his tragic death, Rajiv actually finished whatever was left of Tamil separatism and sympathy for LTT in India. And that is why, that is why Rajapaksha, Mahinda Rajapaksha was able to finish the job 18 years later and Tamil Nadu looked the other way. We've already talked in great detail about his role in launching India's nuclear weaponization. But remember, he also formed, it was his government that formed National Security Guard because the security establishment had learned a bitter lesson from Operation Blue Star. And the lesson was that you don't plonk your army into such divisive, polarizing situations. You need something else. You need something that covers for the army. So the army does not get caught up, army must be seen to be non-partisan. So the National Security Guard was created, a specialized counter-terrorist force under Rajiv Gandhi, and then special protection group for VVIP protection. Irony is a greatly overused and misused word in all journalism. So here I am again, underlining the greatest irony of Rajiv's times. The man who did more to enhance India's military and strategic muscle was destroyed by one of the instruments he brought to make it possible. That is the Bofors gun. But Bofors, however, was just the most visible symbol of Rajiv's failures. In a series of long, on-record conversations with Arun Singh, who became a recluse and rarely if ever speaks, I could see what failed Rajiv. One, he had a poor choice of people. He built an inner circle of talented friends around him. A third of them were sincere and honest, Arun Singh included. The rest were mostly crooks. <laughs> Together, they gave Rajiv's regime an elitist, aloof, apolitical image. Second, much as he started out by cursing the Congress party for all that was wrong with it, he acted no differently. His response to Bofors was imperious, dismissive first, then of self-righteous outrage. Remember his quote, neither I nor any member of my family has taken any commission. And finally, his response was cynical and manipulative as he fixed every probe, stage managed the Joint Parliamentary Committee under loyalist B. Shankaranand. In his core group of friends, only one, Arun Singh counseled him to be more open-minded and transparent, but was contemptuously dismissed repeatedly with a counter question. Why are you getting so exercised? What is it that you want? What is it that I can give you? Name the portfolio you want. All of this stuff I'm not making up. All of this stuff is spoken by Arun Singh on the record in a two-part walk the talk on any TV. I will share the links with you. Meanwhile, most of his other friends, starting with Arun Nehru, had disappeared. Arun Nehru, if anything, went to the other side. He went to VP Singh's side. I'm not a historian. I'm just a journalist. So mine is not a historian's critical reconstruction of the Rajiv era, nor his definitive political biography. I'm merely underlining the fact that 30 years to date when he was assassinated, he remains among our most fascinating leaders. Sadly, more because he ruined his mandate of 415 so badly in the five years in power that the highest his party scored since then, the highest his party has scored since then, since 1984, is 232, was to 232 in 1991. 
He initiated the destruction of his party's heartland vote banks and the rise of Dalit, Mandalite forces and more importantly of the BJP as India's preeminent party upstaging the Congress. My last conversation with him took place at a highway dhaba just as we crossed the Ganga from Baksar in Bihar towards Varanasi during the 1991 election campaign. I had a couple of couple of my India Today colleagues with me, including our camera person, and most importantly, my boss then, my editor Arun Puri. And Rajiv was also accompanied by Suman Dube, who was now working as his media advisor, but was earlier my managing editor in India Today. Rajiv listened to a couple of young villagers talk about their helplessness, responded with sensitivity, sounded as if he had imbibed the right lessons and was going to be a very different, more reformist, economy-oriented prime minister if he, if he was re-elected this time. This was not to be, as this conversation took place just a day before he died in Tamil Nadu. In conclusion, Rajiv was a patriot who ruled at a very tough juncture. His, deg his degree of difficulty unfairly masked by the size of his mandate. What difficulty? He rose in a traumatic moment of extreme personal violence. His mother had just been assassinated. He died seven years later, becoming the history's first prominent victim of a human bomb. In the intervening seven years, he did much good and bad to leave behind a legacy.